Hey there folks, Sorel here. Welcome back to another episode of the Untitled TTRPG Podcast. Today I wanted to spend a little bit of time kind of framing this discussion because originally it was going to be a question of whether or not D&D is actually a team-based game. And I think the answer to that is yes, of course it is. It's designed that way when you look at the, you know, the adventure paths all have an expected amount of, of players that you you want to run with. I mean, there's a lot of considerations when it comes to like monster design and stuff that kind of expect you to have certain roles on the team. So instead of that, John, I wanted to start with the question of how much should a a player be expected to commit to a role in order to play D&D in a way that keeps everybody at the table happy? I One of the things I'll say right out of the gate is theory and reality. There's sometimes a gap between them. Um, so for example, the games that I have both run as a game master and been a part of a party as a player the worst game experiences i've had are when there is not enough diversity among the player character abilities so for example one game i ran the players didn't communicate ahead of time again going back to communication and so we ended up with two warlocks and four melee fighters nope three melee fighters and a cleric that also kind of doubled as a melee fighting character and what my players said was that like one of them specifically at like two sessions in was like can i change my class because i feel completely useless i'm an ancestral uh guardian barbarian next to a bear totem barbarian and the bear totem barbarian the way they built they're just doing more damage and i'm basically doing the same thing but worse and it's not fun so i i think that if you're gonna have a lot of story reasons like let's say it's a setting like dark sun where it's a low magic world and as players in a GM, there's an agreement that there's going to be out of the box solutions and not just playing to the mechanics. I think that you can have a lot of fun with that game style and default out of the box D and D in particular, I think can get very stale if not every player character has something to separate them from the rest of the party. If that makes sense. No, it, it does. And I, I know that you've had a number of traumatic experiences when it comes to, uh, to, to D&D and party composition in particular. And so my this is this is where I differ in opinion is that I think that the the onus falls entirely on the GM to help facilitate what the players want to do. Now, you should advise that the game would probably be more fun if the classes were more diverse. Just as an example, if everybody's playing a thief, I can see some aspects of that, or a thief. If everybody's playing a um, a rogue in Dungeons and Dragons, um, I can see some aspects of that being super fun, where everybody's being sneaky, and then the whole game kind of revolves around this sneakiness. And it would be up to the uh, the DM in that case to help put them in situations where, like you know, you're going on heists and you're you're you know trying to do subterfuge and and that sort of shady business. Because that's the fun part that the players want to experience and setting up combat encounters to help facilitate that and express people's uh, capabilities. For example, like, you know, maybe everybody is meant to like set up and assassinate a guard at the same time. You know, you can create a lot of really fun or outcomes from creating or from using the same types of class. However, when it comes to uh, some aspects of say like, okay, well, if you if you need somebody who can break down a door opposed to pick a lock, then you're kind of at a disadvantage. And if you're following through adventure paths or adventures without a lot of, without the parties consider or composition considered, then yeah, you're going to run into roadblocks that will feel kind of like, like you don't have the right skill set to to deal with, or everybody has the same skill set. And then that it's just like flipping a coin to see who should do the thing. So I think it, it's it's two parts. Uh, first of which is that uh, a lot of, in my opinion, a lot of the onus falls on the the, the GM or the DM, and I, I think that they are ultimately who needs to determine uh, what kind of experience is going to be best suited for your player composition. The second part is that the game also needs to facil- facilitate it, and I don't think that Dungeons and Dragons does that particularly well because it's intended to be designed as a diverse set of you know classes and, and options that fill pretty distinct roles. Yeah, what what I'll say to that is there is there is an onus on the GM. However, the players are also responsible 
for gelling with each other to a certain extent. So what I mean is a, another game, a traumatic one, as you said, was there was a game where a lot of like half the players would act against the party's interest. And so there were like three or four of us that wanted a synergistic experience. And then there was, say, like two or three other players as like a seven person game that were doing their own thing and, and going off and being anti synergetic. So I don't blame the GM for that game. The players are responsible for their own behavior at some point. So as well designed as a GM may make a scenario, if the players are choosing to act in a way that's against the preferences of like the rest of the, and I'm not saying you have to fall in line completely. It's more just, you know, be a kind of aware, empathetic person, like <laughs> that will benefit your table. That That's more what I'm, I was speaking to with the, the sorcerer example is that there is just obviously a, a mismatch between the expectations of that one player and what everybody else had wanted to to just speak on the rogue thing for an exa- for example um the one thing about D&D I think is that some classes are more diverse than others and so there are th- ways that you can play all the same class with a specific situation to get a fun outcome rogue is a great example of that in that you can have four rogues even five four rogues that all have the same subclass But because you can put your expertise in different places and the only real stat that rogues depend on is dexterity, you can have a fairly diverse party with the same class. So when we're talking about diversity, we're talking about the different kinds of moments each player character can have, not necessarily um, like they have to have different classes. That being said, something like all barbarians, barbarians rage and hit stuff. Like that's the only, even if you look at their subclasses, all of the subclasses just change how rage functions. So if you have all barbarians, it ends up being pretty boring, like what I experienced. Um, but with a change of <laughs> It sounds hilarious. It it's a hilarious for an hour, but it's not right. sustainable. So yeah, yeah. like it's like a neat idea for a one shot or uh, one GM I knew did it as like kind of like horde mode um, from a few different video games where it's basically how long can you survive? Like there are in case scenarios where it's fun, but like as a long-term ongoing thing, I don't think you could do it for more than one session. So I, I think that's that's kind of a differentiating point too, is that it, it does, it depends on the type of game that you're running. Like if, if you are running a one-shot, you know, that's a very different experience from running, you know, a, a 12-month campaign. But at the same time, it also depends on how much you actually care about the combat aspect of things. So when it comes to to role play in particular, you like class doesn't even matter necessarily because the experience, the exchanges between the individual players is really what's f- or making up the the majority of the like the the meat of that experience. You know, if that's what people enjoy, then classes are kind of an afterthought. So it comes down to to what kind of game you want to run, and also I'll say that. Okay, so I think Barbarian was a great example of how a class can kind of pigeonhole you into certain mechanics, but multi-classing always lets you kind of like break out of those those different options. Barbarians are in particular, just because of rage, how it kind of removes the capability to, to really um, play with spells might be a little bit of a, uh, a limiting factor in that case. But even so, there are ways where you can do sort of like a Magnificent Seven situation where everybody is technically, you know, the same same class, uh, but have have their uh, you know, individual uh, their, their specialties just by virtue of where they they lean one way or another. And and I don't know how much you'll agree or disagree with this. What I found is you can do that as a player. Like as a player, you can sit down to a table and decide to take it upon yourself to just observe what the preferences and patterns tend to be of your fellow players at a table. Um, And I've had this happen before where I'm the one thing that's not like the others. Um, And I find that if you find that your preferences differ from most of the other people at the table, um, if you decide to communicate more, that yields better results. So for example, one of the things I, I was much more about this in my younger player days um, where I would min-max a lot. 
Um, and I would, I would sometimes play at tables with players that didn't min max at all. They would in fact have like terrible characters, right? <laughs> um, yeah. And I actually wasn't even talking about you, but, uh, so what I learned to do was I, I'd have to almost hide the min maxing a little bit. Um, I learned to play a lot of support characters where it was more making someone else stronger to put the spotlight on them. And so what I find enjoyable about the game is being able to fill gaps, to have a spotlight moment that isn't stepping on the toes of somebody else. One of the worst experiences I remember as a player having was the fact that there was another player at the table who built a healer character and they built their character to only heal. That was all they could do. And I was playing a druid that had the broken version of healing spirit before the errata and I out healed them a complete. And, and they they basically were like, I don't know what to do now. I just, I built my character to heal and you you're both healing and also casting like cantrips and stuff. So I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I felt terrible because I took away that player's moment. So being cognizant of that and just understanding, you know, even if I'm different, how can I make sure that I'm communicating ahead of time? My character build is going to be really weird. So if you want to play a balance party, that's up to the rest of you to figure out. But just know, don't rely on me because I'm going to have a weird build. Everything that we've spoken about here is, well, some of it's like class based stuff, mm -hmm. but for the most part, it's a communication based thing. So people being people. Yeah, is always something that you'll have to navigate. I, I do have a design question, though, which okay. I think is interesting, especially because you're making distal, which is what goes into the design to prevent that pigeonholing if that's something that you don't want. So for me, one of the things with fight, like I said, rogue as a design feels like you could play a party of just rogues with with certain agreements you won't have as much fun with barbarians, at least in my experience. So what what design-wise can happen to avoid that? I, I don't think that you need to design for a traditional Holy Trinity style experience. That's great for video games. Even when you think about it in real, real life, is there really a tank of your group? Maybe, maybe there's somebody that you'd put in front. Uh, or let's, let's say that there's a zombie apocalypse. I know I'm going way out here. But like who who's the one the bruiser uh, up front? Realistically, probably everybody has to be self sufficient in their own right to to some degree, and that will still create a cohesive unit of of people. As long as the game is is created to to leave the the part the strict party roles out of it, then you, the less that you have to worry about it. And the way that Distal does that is that everybody is kind of like really self sufficient. There's no reviving in the game just as an example so you know that there's nobody who needs to have a revive spell right there is no real need to to heal mid combat it's very useful but it is not essential because there are other ways to mitigate incoming damage or play uh you know play in such a way that you uh, aren't really exposing yourself to to harm if you play smartly so the the goal of the game is not to embrace the the damage control, uh, healing or support or whatever uh, aspect, but it's more to uh, for the GM to give you interesting problems to solve, and then let the players solve them in interesting ways. There are certainly like you can lean into certain classes. So I'm going to take a, a cut burst just as an example. Uh, we we talked about how in Five E there they can all kind of you know be stealthy and and uh, play those sorts of situations, but a cut purse in uh in distal is so every three levels you get like a, a specialty and a specialty allows you to to lean toward a different role uh, within the same class and in doing so you you play them more toward a, a fantasy and less less is, is a hard role based on the class that you're you're currently playing for example um the cut purse can be uh it can be that stealthy you know sneaky rogue archetype or it could be scrappy and and be up front and kind of just brawl with people if you want to play more of like a smack talking bard like character you can do that as well and it can kind of lean uh, into that aspect of it the the other side of it is that so that's like so distal is very specifically designed so like you can you can play a party just wholly of the same class and it would probably feel really different and still really fun and by virtue of that um 
And then weapon choice and armor choice matters a whole lot more in this game than it does in D&D because it allows you to do different things. So, for example, you can play, uh, you know, sword and board for any class. It, it doesn't matter. And by virtue of having a shield, you're going to be able to, you know, mitigate more damage. Uh, you can anybody can play with an instrument. That's just a thing that you can do. And uh, and then you know, kick out those uh, that sonic damage and, and that sort of thing. Or you can play with a bow. You can play with, uh, you know, melee weapons. You can play with two handed melee weapon if you're even if you're a cup person, it doesn't matter. There's no class restrictions on weapons. And because of that, you can create really uh, intriguing compositions where class is kind of like, I, I don't want to say that it becomes less important, but there are many things that uh, create uh, sort of like an interesting, sort of intriguing party composition. And it doesn't just boil down to that that one thing that you're good at. Yeah, well, I think that's the the key thing to examine is restriction. So I'm not saying there shouldn't be any restrictions. And like, if you come back to our the the beginning example of where this started from, the the issue wasn't that this player didn't take uh, an AOE spell. The issue is that they were the only character that could, and they didn't. So if everybody could have taken one, then it wouldn't have there wouldn't have been so much pressure for that one player to do it. And so if you're looking for a game that isn't going to put that kind of pressure on a player to be pigeonholed into a role, I feel like either there have to be softer restrictions, kind of like what you're mentioning with Distal, where each class has like a set kit, but like when it comes to armor and weapons, it's not as restrictive. It's either softer restrictions or you restrict what they can do. So if we're playing a zombie apocalypse game, if a player gets bitten by a zombie just using first aid to heal them may not be very compelling depending on your zombie rules or whatever. So how the players approach teamwork is going to look differently than, you know, your damaging and your tank like we usually see in fantasy RPGs. Is there anything else you wanted to jump in? Yeah, so just the flip side of the coin, what what is the interest? What would be the benefit of creating an RPG where there are stricter roles? Because we've talked about how like they don't have to be, but is there value in the opposite direction? Uh, I think there there is. If you were to create a game where playing a, a strict role has a mini game for you, I think that's where the fun comes in. So even in uh, when you look at video games like you know World of Warcraft, when you're playing a tank, it's about keeping the, the aggro on you, facing them away from the from the entire party running and and getting secondary ads and pulling them to you so that they can get aoe down or or so that you can you know take pressure off the healers and that sort of thing so being good at uh at a tank is like it feels super super rewarding i don't know if you that that experience probably doesn't translate one to one to a ttrpg but i feel like there are uh ways to design the game that can give you a similar uh feeling of of reward just by virtue of you know either the the scenario or like what they're throwing out uh, at you, or just the or maybe some resource management that your character has to do to ensure that everybody else um, is is opt- uh, playing at an optimal level. I can see it being fun. Yeah, the interesting balance there uh, actually goes back to our last topic, which is expediency of play. Because I feel almost that's where twenty twenty four went where each class has its own little mini game and its own little resource management. And most of the criticism is that it creates longer turns, which makes it less engaging when it's not your turn. Um, And I do agree, like that would be the fun part of having your own role is that mini game. So I'm, I'm curious what the balance would be where it's not so involved that it's taking away from like other players when it's not their turn versus keeping that, that engagement when it is your turn in 2024 people are saying that the resource management doesn't really matter anymore so why not remove it i I don't agree with that because it's much more fun to to press the button and do the thing than it is to say that this is an infinite resource you know wild shape like should you be able to wild shape anytime you want you know should you uh the the warlock you know being able to to get its its slots back and, and that sort of thing like adding mechanics so that you can do that. And even if you have enough resources, the GM can always extend that play 
to to make you dip in to that that pool that you didn't uh, that maybe you don't dip into to all the time. Whereas in, in 2014, it's like you're always at full resources. You know you're going to have you know just uh, one combat and nothing really matters. And the the warlock subclass, just as an example, suffered for it greatly because it was centered around short rests. You know, getting back those those resources. Where if you're not doing that, then it doesn't matter. So in 2024, they've built all the classes in such a way that you can you can walk into a game, have your full pool of resources, everybody can, and uh, and then they all get kind of stretched out the same way if the GM decides to go sort of toward that path of um, of attrition, that attrition-based gameplay. I don't know. It's, it's definitely a balance, but I, I think that overall, you can design a, ga- design a game that's way more streamlined, has more mini-game components, and all of that can happen just you know, in a turn or between turns, it, it really depends on how it's how it's manufactured. Yeah, it is an interesting balance thing because one of the experiences I've had was the opposite, being that, oh my goodness, I only have a limited number of uses of these. I need to save them and then they never use them. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, yeah, the elixir problem. Exactly, yeah. So I, I've had a lot of new players like gravitate towards spellcasters from a storytelling perspective. And then at the end of the, the day, they have... They had they didn't spend a single spell slot. And so like it's it's that like I agree with you. There is like to me, again, playing a lot of casters and a lot of healers, there's a lot of fun in that resource management and pressing the button on a limited resource. Um, and it's just and again, this comes back to, I think, from a design standpoint, being very clear on what kind of design you have. Um with D&D, the problem is that it's kind of a little bit watered down. So it's trying to appeal to a lot of different people, um, which makes it hard. It means it it's easier to attract incompatible personalities with certain game styles. And now there's extra pressure on the GM to try to figure out how to juggle all of the different preferences into something everybody's going to enjoy. One of the things you mentioned is uh, in, in my little play test game, which is based off of 5e's chassis, um, I'm playing with removing the limit on wild shape, but also having it tied to your player HP and also tied to concentration. Um, so there's still a limit. It's in that you have to concentrate on it so you can't cast concentration spells. Um, and I am sure there are people that would hate that. <laughs> and I'm also sure that there are some people who would love that. So it's figuring out, you know, knowing that there's going to be people who hate it, are there enough people that love it to make the change worth it? And and I do think that listening to Wizards of the Coast, especially in their after like giving what the survey feedback is, it tends to be if people hate it, they like they just don't do it. <laughs> I forget how you phrased it, but um, the the audience being so broad that it has a greater possibility of attracting incompatible personalities. Yeah, that is probably at the crux of a lot of D&D's design issues. And I mean, obviously, amazing game. It's very good. We've just been playing it for a very long time. If you've played any game for, for a long period of time, there's less wonder and curiosity, and you start to know too much. And uh, you know, certain things become boring, and you try to you get to that point where you're trying to break the game or you find all the broken bits that are already existed and then you kind of just hone in on those because you don't have anything better to do with your time sorry let's I, let's read it i don't know if um, i necessarily agree <laughs> yeah. like all right, so you'll I, get there john yeah i i do love 5e and oftentimes i'm talking i'm talking critically about it because again i find that that if, if all we did was talk about how wonderful everything is there wouldn't be a lot of actionable things to help you improve as a game master or make you more aware so you kind of have to be you have to identify a problem so that we can provide a solution that's what makes the conversation interesting for sure uh but yeah the the attracting incompatible personalities is really interesting because that's so i I haven't taken a look at the 2024 uh dungeons and dragons uh, player's handbook but i wonder how much of it i wonder how much of it tries to find the right audience now wager it probably doesn't because it's so so kind of wide open and in Distal in particular, a lot of the game structure, we're getting totally off topic now. Um, a lot of the game structures around making sure you know what the game is about, facilitating a conversation with the GM based on the character that you've you've created. Like that happens, it's like the first step. So you're going to be talking to the GM because that social layer, 
that lives on top of the game is, is very, very important. And it's the, it leads to the most problems in a TTRPG, just like regardless of the design, because design is something that you can always amend. You can, uh, you can work around, you can find the, the fun parts of it. But when it comes to the people, people are way more complex, difficult, and incompatible at times. So learning to set the expectations is something that games should design for. And I totally think that we can do it. Yeah, it's, it's so it's it's just interesting to. All right, let's say we complained about Wizards of the Coast. Let's look at another game that takes the opposite path. Ha ha um, to a different effect. So Pathfinder second edition um, has an audience that loves it. When I was thinking about converting my group from 5e to Pathfinder, um, I was reading all sorts of forums and conversations and looking up videos on YouTube and pretty much the people that loved it, loved it. And they and they were all saying the same things about what they loved about it. Like the horizontal as opposed to vertical progression, um, the three action economy, uh, how the way that attacks were structured made it a boring tax. Basically, if all you did was attack instead of taking other interesting options, I tried it for my table. We didn't like it. And to us, the cost of learning all of its intricacies was not worth the benefits that we were getting out of it because most of those intricacies were creating rules for things that we would rather hand wave to begin with. So that being said, as I talk to more people, there are a lot of people that really don't like Pathfinder 2nd Edition because of the amount of rules. And because they know they don't like it, they don't need to talk about it. So it's not like it's going to benefit from being like, you know, I hate Pathfinder, boo. Like, usually there are some videos where it's like, we tried Pathfinder, it didn't work out for us for X, Y, Z, on to the next thing. And I think that's the benefit of having a very clear idea of what your game is and who the audience is, is Paizo is developing Pathfinder for people who love Pathfinder. That means that their audience is going to really love it and... To be honest, it's not as financially successful as D&D. So we, you could have an argument of whether the design is better or the morality is better. And at the end of the day, it's not making as much money. So it's what is your outcome? For D&D, the outcome is money. So they are succeeding in their design of generating revenue for shareholders. That's just the reality of it. Um, Matt Colville, having listened to the latest episode of the Eldritch Lorecast by Ghostfire Gaming, he wants to create a great game that's going to make his customers happy. Probably, we'll see, probably isn't going to eclipse D&D. And it's because his system is much more specific and is also geared toward people who like his style and his content and his way of running games. So I think if you're like thinking about designing your own system, it does a lot of good to first be very clear on your outcome. Distal, I know for you, is not supposed to eclipse D and D that's not, that's never been your goal. And it's um, never in the cards. Like yeah. I don't think that that's in the cards for anybody, including Pathfinder, including Daggerheart. I know we've, we've touched on this stuff in the past, but just to kind of set expectations is X game, the next D and D killer. It's not, it might be someday, but I don't think we'll live that long. Yeah. There's gotta be a lot of things that happen and change for that to be the case. And, you know, because you're clear on what you want out of distal, how much easier is it to design the game or look at a mechanic like HP bloat and be like, that's not going to convey the story I want to tell. Yeah, no, it, it does make it easier for sure. Uh, okay. Well, maybe this episode gets turned into two separate parts because these are two totally different conversations. Hey, in the comments, like, let us know if you mind the rambliness, like if you want something a little more structured with bullet points, or if you don't mind us just going from one thing to the other thing. So that way we know. All right. Fine. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, if this video has been interesting, helpful, entertaining, despite its uh, nature, feel free to leave those thoughts in the comment section down below, and we'll uh, catch you in the next one. Thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.